Right, we're now live. Welcome to the webinar in our PiQ webinar series with Mike Sargent here. Um, I'm Alison Jones, Director of Practical Inspiration Publishing, host of the Extraordinary Business Book Club. Uh, it's very, very good to have you here. And as you probably know by now, the aim of these webinars is to explore how work is changing uh, in these unprecedented times and also to give us the insights and the strategies and the skills to help us navigate that transformation better. And we've got some fantastic practical inspiration authors lined up over the coming weeks. If you have a particular topic that you would like us to cover uh, or any feedback on how we can improve these sessions, make them even more useful, then do drop me a line afterwards. It's alison at alisonjones.com. So a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce Mike, uh, your audio and video should be off and we'll keep them that way throughout the talk if that's okay, just to avoid distractions. Um, if you have questions or comments, and I hope you will, just put them in the chat as they occur to you because I'm going to be monitoring the chat. Um, I'll do my best to pick them up and I'll either invite you to put them to Mike at the end, uh, the Q&A session, or, um, or unmute you and you can put them to yourself. So as you know, the session's being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording of the full thing afterwards. And I'll also be putting the, the talk, not the Q&A bit, up on the Practical Inspiration YouTube channel and on the PiQ e-learning platform for our authors. Right, enough talk. Let me introduce today's speaker. Mike Sargent is an international communications coach and PR advisor to CEOs and business leaders. Through his company Sargent Leaders, he delivers media training, public speaking coaching and reputation advice. Mike began his career at CNN in 1996 before moving to Reuters, Sky News and the BBC, where he spent 13 years as a TV and radio correspondent covering business, politics and the Middle East. And he lives in North London with his wife and two sons. He's also, of course, wonderfully the author of PR for Humans, which was published by Practical Inspiration. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. Wonderful to be here. Really, really good to have you here. And what a time to be talking about reputation management and communications. So let's just start off with that. You know, what, what are we actually talking about when we're talking about PR in a crisis situation? Is it about damage limitation, managing the message, or can it actually be about promotion and brand and so on? Well, first thing to say is um, I spent most of my career as a, as a reporter on the other side of the fence, looking at uh, governments, looking at companies, looking at organizations, going through crisis. And when you're a reporter, you think, why can't these people just sort themselves out? Why can't, why are they really struggling so much to get on top of a crisis and to give that kind of clarity, to show they're figuring things out, to get the right words and so on. But when you're, when you're on the other side, and you, as I am now more advising companies and advising individuals, it is a lot harder. It is a lot harder. So the first thing I would say is this is not easy. Um, it's not easy because it's very hard to work out where you, you are. It's very hard to work out what your audiences are really thinking. And it's very hard to have an up to the minute sense of the context out there. You know, like what are, what are the currents that are currently playing and, and how are you going to be judged if you, if you dive into those? So it's difficult, but I, but I think, you know, public relations ultimately, is about relations with the public so we don't want to over over complicate it pr got a got a bad reputation but what it should be in theory is just communicating with your audiences giving them the information they need um putting forward what you're up to uh, so there's nothing inherently kind of sinister about pr or a sense that pr can't happen in certain situations or can happen in certain situations it can happen in in a crisis situation it just has to happen in rather a different way it's interesting what you say about journalists and your own experience as journalists thinking oh come on people this is not so hard and, <laughs> and then realizing actually it is harder and i think do you think that's maybe one of the issues that people face today i'm thinking particularly politicians but also business leaders that sense that there's a media out there that's waiting to judge and that's ready to jump on the slightest show of weakness or wrong judgment call. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons I left journalism because I was um, exhausted by the negativity. Uh, of, you know, journalism is all about death, destruction, disaster, scandal, resignation. Um, people in, in the media are looking for things to go wrong, not because they're bad people, it's just human nature and that's what allows a story to um, mostly get attention. So there's a massive negativity bias out there. And that is why um, if you're a politician or if you're a business leader, often you don't put yourself in front of the media. You don't try and go out there because you are fearful of that judgment. In, in normal times, the judgment can be very quick and very harsh. But right now in the coronavirus crisis, we see the, the, the media dividing our business uh, leaders into heroes and villains. 
very, very quickly and our politicians into heroes and villains. Everyone is kind of pushed one way or the other. No one can just be kind of, you know, muddling through and doing their best. It's, it's quite an extreme viewpoint that the media adopts. And so, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's a difficult climate for anyone to work out how to communicate what to say and and when to say it but but communicate they must because well exactly you know one of the one of the difficult things is is you know there's a crisis out there quick let's hide under the table let's put on our our tin hats and let's just hope it goes away now this probably won't go away quickly so it's so a point number one and point number two there's always a scramble for attention in, in good times and bad you, you need to show that you're you're still operational as a business you need to show that you're still relevant you need to show that um your customers still matter to you but doing that in the right way finding the right language uh is is very very tricky and to do it in a way which uh maintains or enhances your reputation rather than uh, allows your reputation to slide which we've seen many examples of in recent weeks Yes, absolutely. So with that in mind and understanding that the only thing worse than uh, doing communications is not doing communications, <laughs> what are your top tips for, for how you manage your message at a time like this? Um, I think the first thing is to understand what kind of business that you are. Um, and some businesses at the moment are in genuine shutdown, as, as we all know. I think for those businesses, uh, it's very hard to do any kind of active PR in, in the promotional sense. They just have to hunker down uh, where necessary and where possible, tell their customers that they, you know, they still exist and they're, you know, they're raring to get back into, into action. But you can't do much above the line uh, promotion, uh, of course. There are other businesses though who, who who are continuing to operate, maybe at slightly lower levels, and maybe some of them are actually doing quite well out of the current uh, situation. Uh, their job is to um, communicate with their audiences as well, but not in a way that seems opportunistic mm. not in a way that seems like they're kind of trying to pretend that they are single-handedly saving the nation or saving the world not trying to pretend that they have the responsibility to fix things or to bring everyone together and i think some of the pr uh, and communications fails that we've seen in in recent weeks have been examples where companies have just overstepped the mark they've been in my view this is all in my view so pe people can take different opinions about different companies and what they're doing but that they're they are trying to present a view of themselves to the world which is just a bit far removed from what they're basically doing as a company that's always a dangerous thing in in pr and, and communication in my view when the real story and the story you're trying to project are just a little bit too far apart so and that's where people get very suspicious and that's where there can be quite a lot of reputational damage in this kind of uh, time of heightened scrutiny that we're living through at the moment and it's interesting you talk about stories because i know that that's one of the things you, you talk about a lot is storytelling that's that's, mm. that's sort of what you're doing and not not in a fictionalized way but you're actually you're putting a narrative around your role in the world and i guess that's part of the issue isn't it that has some companies have got a pretension that their role in the world is rather more significant than it really is. But how, what are the principles of, of storytelling when it comes to communications and, and how are they different today, do you think? Well, in the normal crisis um, playbook, the, the one that most PR uh, practitioners would use, would be, you know, a crisis hits, what do you do first of all? You lead on empathy. You, you show the people out there that you care and that they matter. Secondly, you take responsibility. So you, you may not admit that you failed, but you take responsibility for what you, your part of it in it may be. Thirdly, you promise to put it right. But that's a crisis affecting one company or maybe one sector. Now, of course, we've got a crisis that is not confined to one company, one nation, or even, even one continent. So the playbook has changed. Um, it's very hard for companies to show that they can have responsibility uh, for, for fixing uh, the current uh, situation or for actually helping patients get better from uh, COVID-19 or helping to mobilize people so they can provide um, care for others. Those companies have to just think, right, what are we actually doing here? What is the core product that we have? Is it relevant directly to the current crisis? And if it's not, then the story has to be, um, you know, here we are, uh, we're still operating, we're confident about the future, be very transparent with the way in which you communicate, be timely with your communications, uh, but not try to over egg your, your role in being, being the saviors. And I think it's, it's those mismatches that 
have been the cause of a lot of the problems. In terms of storytelling, though, you know, this, this is a moment where there is one massive dominant story. So um, it's, it's the extent to which companies and organizations can be part of that story, which is the key, key question. You know, a lot of them can't be part of the big story, but they are there in the background. We do look to them. We do want them to keep supplying uh, in the future or now if they can, our favorite services, our favorite products, and uh, whatever, whatever it is that we like from that company. But their story must be rooted in their reality. And that's the, for me, that's the guiding principle of all PR and communication. And it's interesting, we're talking about business as usual in a sense and, and how mm. companies just... One of the things that I've noticed companies doing is reinvention, reinventing themselves, but also perhaps looking at their customers and seeing what they're doing and sort of responding to that. So there's, in a sense, there's a potential opens up there, isn't there? And it's very hard to manage communications there because it's so emergent. Have you seen anything mm. going on in that kind of space? I think that there's there's a lot going on in in that kind of space, and and you look at some of the big global companies, and um, you know BP is a good example, Siemens is another example, where they're seeing what their role can be in yeah. in reshaping the world and what their role can't be, and for them the reality you know does seem to be changing pretty quickly. Uh, they can be part of uh, you know the solution or part of another big problem perhaps that that may be coming down the tracks. So I think in in those situations. Uh, they can certainly, you know, find um, a way of presenting themselves and, you know, completely reimagining the way they do business. Maybe, maybe for the future. But, but I'm also a bit, a bit sceptical of um, just how many companies are going to be completely reimagining themselves. I think what would reassure me at the moment, and, and there are many examples of this, is companies that are coming out and saying this, this crisis doesn't mean we need a completely new strategy. What, we, what this crisis can demonstrate is how important our existing strategy really is. And those companies are the ones where, that I look at and think, wow, that, that does show strength in these sorts of times. Maybe some of the tactics they'll be using are different. Maybe some of the ways in which they're interacting will be different. But fundamentally, the strategy of the business is the same as it, as it was before the crisis. And I think anyone who can demonstrate that can be in a good place. There are those, of course, and we saw the, the example with, with British Airways, where the company has had to make some pretty drastic decisions uh, in the last 24 hours because the whole nature of you know, air travel may change for quite a long period of time. So there will be those where they have to reinvent themselves, they have to change the strategy, they have to do some very tough things. Um, but for others, be careful, would be my, if I'm advising them, be careful of going out there and saying, the world's completely changed, let's reimagine things, uh, let's, let's rewire every single thing we do. Probably not necessary, probably better to be, to be calm and to demonstrate that you know, the, the great company you were six months ago is the great company you'll still be in six months' time. You touched on an interesting point. Um, when you have bad news to tell, how do you do it well? Uh, in the right, the right time, uh, with the right level of honesty, sometimes by, um, you, you know, getting your audience ready for the bad news uh, that's coming. Sometimes, you know, by, by softening up opinion in, in, in that way. Some, often by saying, you know, here is the situation that we are genuinely facing. And it, it is a battle for survival. And it is a battle for, um, you know, the future. Um, success of, of the business. So, so you, you can raise the stakes, you can be very transparent, as transparent as you possibly can, but it is difficult. You know, no CEO likes delivering that kind of bad news. They all want to um, not to have to do it. Um, but uh, if, if you do have to do it, do it at the right time. Don't hang on too long. But equally, um, if, if there's a way in which you can currently get through the next three weeks, the next few months, without furloughing all your staff, without making them redundant, without going cap in hand to the government, if you can find the funding, not every business can, can but if you can find the funding, then you, there's tremendous gain in terms of reputation, I think, for those businesses that can say, uh, we actually did it, we got through it on our own, um, and we didn't go to the taxpayer and we didn't needlessly furlough staff and we didn't needlessly make our staff redundant. So there's tremendous points that can be earned there, but 
it, it's, I know it's very, very difficult for some businesses who simply can't get access to the funding we need quickly enough. Well, and in a sense, the opposite question to you, if you're in that fortunate position, if you do a good job as a business, what's the appropriate way to get that message out without sounding insufferably smug? Um, I think it's just keep it fact based. Um, you know, d don't, d uh, what, 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 the, the, the statements that grate a little bit with me are the ones that show, you know, try to demonstrate we will be, we'll come out of this, you know, stronger than ever. We're in a brilliant position to weather the crisis. We, we did everything right because, you know, as we've seen, things are moving very, very fast in recent weeks and a business which may be feeling very, very confident and secure may need help in just a few weeks time. And, and as we move through the different stages of this of this crisis, I think business leaders need to be to be aware of that. So if if a company is doing well, um, it's a time to 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 be careful, to be cautious, uh, to be calm. Yes, be confident, uh, but also be be aware that um, you know, in the view of many experts, we're we're really at the beginning of of this crisis and not not near the end but things can change very quickly and, and it's you know it's easy to, to get too um obsessed with with um the negatives too obsessed with the potential downsides for the economy for jobs and everything else as i see uh, com companies moving through crisis there are different stages where we, we we have the kind of you know at first we are kind of in denial and then we go through acceptance and, and then we, we realize we're in for the long haul and we go through a stage of fear and then we go through to emergence and companies may at the moment be worried about the tone they're they're giving out are we being too commercial are we trying to sell our products at this time when people are dying and, and, and those are really really important questions in communications but then a few weeks from now the whole focus could be on how are we getting the economy going again and then we will look to those companies that can demonstrate commercial strength that can demonstrate they can sell things that they can open up that they can um they can be going concerns and profitable again so so it can change really really quickly we, we've seen we've seen we see very very rapid uh, shifts in what audiences will tolerate um from from businesses uh, as we move through the different stages of crisis and just as people were very slow at the beginning to think uh you know okay we need to change the tone of our advertising the tone of our marketing uh, we need to show more compassion. We need to show more empathy. All those things were right, but you know, you don't, mustn't get stuck in this mindset either, where we could be through into a diff completely different stage in a few weeks' time. Hopefully, we will be, um, where actually we want our companies to be proud, to be out there, to be selling, to be doing well. So that 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 can come quickly, and people could miss the upside as well as being in, in slightly the wrong place in terms of their communication when the actual crisis was at, at its at its peak. And of course, it's not monolithic, is it? I mean, these strands are sort of going on, but one, one's dominant at any one time. It's, when I talk to authors about writing books, I very much talk to them about reading as well and, and being immersed in the conversation that's going on in your space. This is almost a microcosm of that, isn't it? Just having your finger on the pulse of, of what the news is saying, what the story is, what the dominant themes are at the moment. Yeah, and it's, it's back to the old, um, the old uh, piece of advice that to communicate well, you have to listen. Yeah. Um, and the, the best thing that, CEOs and business leaders can do in terms of their communication sometimes is to stop talking and, and start listening a bit more and listening to their, their, their employees, um, listening to their investors, listening to their customers, and listening to their governments. And, and the more listening people can do, generally the better they are as, as communicators and where communication fails, it's where we haven't, we haven't listened, not listened really, not hard enough. We haven't listened in the sense that we've, we've understood what people are, are really feeling, not just thinking, but feeling uh, at this moment in time. And so listening is, 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 is always, I think, a good uh, piece of advice for, for leaders, leaders who want to show um, that they're on top of things, who want to communicate powerfully. We, we, we listen to listeners. That's a great phrase. And we've talked mainly about big business here, because that's what we see, that's the really visible stuff. Are these principles the same for small businesses, for micro businesses? Are there any particular considerations that small business owners need to keep in mind? Um, I think some of these principles are, are, are timeless. So as well as the fact we've got the, the ups and downs of where we are in the cycle and what that means for our PR, communications, marketing and advertising, we've also got what do we want, what do we expect from from leaders of businesses and those could be CEOs of multinationals or it could be the, the owner of the, um, the cafe down the road. It doesn't really matter. And I think what we want from those people is, is 
what I call the three C's to be to be considerate, to be calm, and to be confident. So so we're we're looking to them to be considerate, of course, considerate of their of their employees, considerate of their customers, uh, considerate of their suppliers as well. And I think those things are very very important to show that kind of empathy. But it's not just empathy uh, that that people need at, at this moment in time. It's it's empathy with a plan. You know, it's it's no use just saying, and I, I feel your pain, and I. I, I'm, I'm a highly emotional person and I, and I get the, the way that, that everyone is, is responding to this crisis. What we also want from owners of businesses, large and small, some sense of uh, where they're going, how they're getting through this. It's the confidence, that's the second C. So, so you know, it's the be considerate, be confident. Uh, be confident, not in, it, not in, a, in a, a, a crazy way where we're claiming this is gonna be a great thing for our business and, and all the rest of it, but just that we're, we're gonna get through it because we're fundamentally a sound business. The proposition is still what the proposition was and so on. So we look to those people, but also uh, people who can show the degree of calmness that is, that is needed at these times. And I, and I think when I, when I look to the businesses who are communicating with me at the moment by, by email or by social media, or you know, whether it's, it's um, schools or whether it's um, coaches or whether it's um, those trying to sell me products, I'm looking for that, those three C's to come through. Uh, but not in, in, um, in, a, in, in a robotic way, of course, to keep it human. That's, that's my, my mantra with all communications. Um, and um, not in a way which is deluging me with those kind of saccharine mail shots. Um, so, so I think the frequency of communication maybe can come down a little bit for most businesses. I think they may be overdoing it a bit. Um, the tone can maybe could go from a totally emotional tone to here's emotional with a plan and here we are here's what we're doing and here are the things you can you can the ways in which you can interact with us so clear calm confident and considerate brilliant who's doing it really well mike any good examples i think it's it's always hard when you pick examples because who's doing it well this week uh maybe maybe won't be doing it so well next who's doing week. it well so at the we, moment we, who's doing it well at the moment I, so i think um i've mentioned um BP in, in my writing and I think Bernard Looney the new CEO had a very difficult uh, task coming in this year um, in brand new to the job and he immediately came out and said we're going to make this organization you know net zero in terms of carbon we're going to transform BP here's the new strategy and then he was hit with this this crisis which is obviously a massive threat to, to them um, the price of oil has crashed and in, in the US it was briefly uh, mm. negative even um, so so enor amidst enormous challenges I think BP is their communication is very personal communication uh, from the CEO uh, a lot of uh, video updates a lot of, of quite measured social media posts but but what the point I was making about the strategy being consistent you know the strategy before is the strategy now and that's coming through very very uh, very clearly although there will be you know be lots of people out there criticizing uh, BP and, and in fact any of the companies that, that I mentioned but I think purely in terms of top-line communications I think he's getting it about right I think some of those uh, companies that have, have got a clear role to play um, either in providing medical equipment or indeed keeping our food supply going uh, have done have done well you know partly because they've got just a, a lot to be getting on with and that's always helpful in communications terms where you've got something real to talk about uh, Tesco, I think, is is a, is a decent example that, that they kept the food supply going, but they also kept the communications going in a way that seemed to me, um, from the, the the view I have of their of their posts and their media interaction, uh, seemed to me to be pretty transparent, pretty calm, uh, pretty composed whilst responding to this crisis. Um, and then uh, you've got the third example I would give would be HSBC. Um, they've had, you know, again, they are in the eye of the storm in many ways in terms of their their balance their balance sheet, um, their lending, um, everything that's all the pressures they're going to face as a major international bank. Uh, they had a big round of job cuts that was planned and announced. And now they've put those job cuts on hold, um, not because they don't need to make them. They still say they need to make them, but the 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 view that's come through in the communications is that those people will not be able to find alternative employment in this current climate. So, so that seemed to be quite a, a, a considerate, compassionate um, approach, at least to the communications. But I say, you know, for every bit of praise, you could go out there and find <laughs> someone else or another aspect in which these companies will be facing criticism. And I, and I think um, what, a few months from now, it'll be quite hard to identify the absolute winners, that those who played a, a, a perfect game 
uh, through all of this and it'd be, be a lot easier to to look for those we can criticize well let's do a bit of that now shall we who's doing it really yeah. poorly <laughs> um i it was interesting i was talking to to my uh my 14 year old son about this and uh and I said, well, what, what annoys you at the moment uh, with, with companies? You might see them on TV or anything else. And he said, well, what annoys me is when I'm watching a um, TV advert for McCain's oven chips or for Persil or for, you know, these things. And they try to present uh, this image that somehow they are bringing the nation together. And they even kind of almost branded at the end, you know, like, like hashtag stay, stay home or hashtag stay connected or, you know, home is good. They'll, they'll find a little... A little um, a, a way of turning this into a branded almost campaign which seems to show or seems to claim that um, they are the saviors in, in some some way shape or form and for him that that and I thought that, that's absolutely right that's that's what um, that's what I think too and um, so one example of that was was Persil running running a lot of ads with with their branding kind of home is good all over it another was Virgin Media with a with a hashtag stay connected the PR campaign. Um, the one that's talked about a lot in PR circles was Brewdog, which which had a they had a great idea, which was to convert their um, production of beer facilities into into hand sanitizers. Uh, before they found out these these sanitizers didn't meet medical standards, so that was a, that was a blow. But I think the real criticism came because they 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 delivered them, but they delivered them in a in a kind of branded way. So they delivered them as punk hand sanitizer from Brewdog, which was which was an attempt, a misguided attempt, I think, to uh, get your brand uh, into the comms and into the PR in, an, in a way you didn't need to because it was there already. So I, I think, and, and I think all these things, they, they, you know, they could have sounded like very good ideas uh, in the meeting, um, all I'm sure done with good intentions and, and pe people trying to do the right thing, but all can, can misfire and I think they can jar uh, with, with audiences uh, because, you know, for those reasons that, that I that I set out earlier, that people are claiming to be something that they're not really, if if, if we're totally honest. So to keep it real, keep it true. Um, don't spin, don't lie, um, and don't overclaim. Um, just just keep the facts coming uh, is is probably the best advice that you could give for communication at the moment. And 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 always, in fact, not just now. And Brilliant. always, yeah, yeah, and always, good. yeah. I mean, it's you know, people think oh, PR is about uh, spinning or exaggerating or whatever. Well, um, it's 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 certainly not about lying, and it's very rarely effective spinning. Um, I think it's it's of course selective version of a story and a set of facts, but the story's got to be rooted in 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 truth, uh, at least your version of the truth, for it to carry carry resonance. And always, 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 the problems come when um, the way in which an organisation is trying to present itself. And the facts just don't match and, and people aren't stupid and, and i think audiences are incredibly sophisticated even if they don't uh, analyze all the facts and understand all the numbers they can they can see when the tone is wrong i mean we're so, as human beings i think we're so good at feeling when something just doesn't quite look right or sound right and so so you, they will you know audiences will see through companies like that very very quickly and and it's not to say they shouldn't try uh, it's not to say they shouldn't help. It's not to say that businesses shouldn't support charities or try to help to mobilize, um, to, to support hospitals or, or anything else. I think, the, you know, these things are really, really important. But just make sure that your communications and what you're doing on the ground are very, very, very well aligned. And I have to say that the, the clarity of thinking and the cynicism of your son gives me real hope <laughs> for the next generation. Oh, yeah. No, I think he'll, he'll be far better at this job than ever now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, I think the, the, the younger generation, they, they, they can see right through um, the kind of corporate marketing advertising that is just um, doesn't quite gel, doesn't quite match. And um, so, so, yeah, the, our hope for the future is, is, is high if, uh, if they can come through and take positions of responsibility one day. Brilliant. Which is a great note to end on. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. It was absolutely brilliant.
All right, we're going to wrap up the Q&A there. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Just so much really fascinating and insightful and also really down and dirty practical uh, stuff today. So thank you very, very much. Just a few final words from me. Uh, do join us next week. We've got change superhero Lucinda Carney on coping with change, but also helping your team cope with it too. And then the following week, we've got um, an ex-Big Four accountant, Andy Salkelt, talking about mental health at work and particularly in lockdown and with remote working. So if you've got any issues that you particularly like us to cover, as I say, do drop me an email, alisonalisonjones.com. Um, and of course, if you'd like to explore becoming a practical inspiration author yourself, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, we are very, very proud to be publishing partners with leaders in a wide range of fields, including Mike here, of course. Uh, you can find out more about us at practicalinspiration.com. Lots of the thank yous and, oh, that was really good, it's coming in on the chat. This is wonderful. Thank you. Um, and that really is it. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mike, on behalf of all of us. And uh, hope to see you all back here next week for another PiQ webinar. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.